I am Pauli and uh, I'll talk about Malli regex schemas as you might have already seen. <laughs> um, so why me? I work at Metosin for almost three years. And uh, towards the end of that, Tommy asked me to work on the Malli regex uh, SecX schema stuff because Uh, as you will see, it's quite theoretical and uh, I like that kind of stuff and well, most other people don't really or they haven't read so much about that. And um, I also made a blog about this, which many you of you probably have read. And this talk is going to have a lot of the same stuff but um, different people learn in different ways. So let's hope that this will add something to that. And uh, so a few months ago I quit and my intention was to work full time on open source, but for the last month I haven't been actually coding that much because there are other things going on. And um, to be fair, there wasn't a grand master plan anyway. So I thought that um, if I was busy with challenging consulting work, I couldn't really even make great plans in the evenings or something like that. I need some breathing space. Um, anyway, you can find my stuff at GitHub. And I even have a sponsors page. Um, so what do I even mean by regex schemas or SecX? Um, in Mali, the normal Closure Java, JavaScript, regex is work as schemas. So you can like make a little regex and check your string against that just fine. But what this talk is about the sequence regexes, or I like to use this SecX term, which comes from the SecX, SecX library which uh, pioneered this concept and later on it was also heavily featured in spec. So Molly has to have it, have it too. And so the one thing that you can do is like, you can use the clean stars to say, you know, I have zero or more. And then here we have a concatenation like zero or more key value pairs where the keys are strings and the values are either strings or booleans and then we can use validate or here I have an example with explain where it uh, notices that uh, this one thing is actually an integer and not a string or a boolean and then you like get all the possible errors as you do with uh, explain or nearly if it was fine. Uh, but probably when you're calling explain, you already know that something is off. Um, yeah, so there are some basic regex operators and many more, maybe not so basic ones. Um, the empty string or a sequence is one of them. It will match the empty string or sequence. And uh, then there's the, a literal character which will match a literal character. Or in Mali we have an element schema. Like you can put any schema as a, a SecX schema and it will like match one element in the sequence. 
and uh, then we have concatenation which is like first uh, something then something else and like it's very edic you can even have no sub schemas like in the empty case and then there's alternation like either this thing or that thing and this is uh, different from uh, from or or multi and those schemas in the way that um, these have to be sequence schemas or if they are not like SecX schemas stuck in here then they are uh, interpreted uh, as if they are part of a SecX schema so this will match a sequence of one thing which is either string or an integer and uh, then we have the clean star uh, which matches uh, zero or more and then uh, you know you we have option which matches zero or one of this uh, int or whatever and uh, clean plus which matches one or more and repeat which matches at minimum uh, one of a minimum and maximum and these are uh, both inclusive unlike like, the closure range function and stuff like that and uh, I didn't like this because uh, long ago Dijkstra said that you know the upper bound should be exclusive blah 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 but it makes sense in validation because that's usually the requirement is uh, inclusive so I don't complain about it too much but anyway these are uh, not primitive although we might think they are pretty basic they can be expressed in terms of the more primitive ones um okay so especially when these are combined with recursion using rf you can do pretty complicated stuff like here we have a hiccup schema i'm not sure if this is complete but anyway so a hiccup element is either a sequence which is pretty complicated or uh, it's an atom which is a nil boolean number string blah blah um, and the sequence schema is like we have the name which is the keyword and uh, then you have the optional props map and then any number of children which are hiccup nodes which is this ref yeah and then you can just use it to like parse a little hiccup form here and it will um, give you a map of like the name and the properties and then the children as a sequence and of course you could also validate that and all the other things which are these are like the basic operators in Mali like we can validate something which just gives a boolean whether it's valid against the scheme or not or we can explain which gives nil it if it's valid and like that error format that I showed earlier if not and that error format has like the paths and all the possible ways that this could have gone wrong why it's not valid and, and then we have encode and decode that are just pretty generic transformations 
uh, you can parse <laughs> dates or and that side of thing using those and then there's parse and unparse which are i already showed that parse actually but i uh, parse is a kind of destructuring or pattern matching and uh unparse takes the parse thing and uh, reconstructs the sequence. And uh, all of these work for any schema and they had to work for this SIGX schemas as well. Um, so one decision, decision that I made is that um, we should actually have regex operator, operators for sequences and uh, not like spec has kind of an EBNF thing actually where you can uh, use recursion so that you can actually express any context free language. Like here I have this uh, monster spec which uh, parses um, S expressions. So it matches the parentheses and all that. And um, you can't do that with regular expressions, like match uh, recursive structures like this. So spec is actually doesn't have regex operators it has like ebnf operators or something like that and um, i don't think they planned this like it just arose naturally from adding the segex operators and already being able to do recursion with uh, references but uh, this has some issues like I think if you're going to allow any context-free grammar then you should actually handle every context-free grammar properly and uh, the spec implementation has the typical LL parsing problem where left recursion leads to stack overflow when the it's not intuitive at all why that happens unless you have read like 2000 pages of parsing books like I have <laughs> for no good reason. And also context-free languages can be ambiguous and in that case you would need to return all possible parse trees like insta parse dash and you can also have infinitely ambiguous grammars so there might be an infinite number of those parse trees and uh, you know probably nobody actually wants to have an ambiguous schema but also in this grammar theory we know that there are no real good methods to disallow ambiguous grammars by analyzing the grammar like pretty much the best you can do is construct an lr parser and if that fails then you uh, might have an ambiguous grammar but it might just be a non-deterministic grammar i don't want to go into that but uh, clearly nobody wants to deal with uh, shift reduced conflicts either. So I thought look, it's best to just ban this kind of uh, recursion inside SIGX. And uh, so that's what I did. And uh, later we'll see that it actually simplifies the implementation a lot. And uh, most of the time you 
don't even need to do that so it's fine that it's not possible like i have seen like one complaint about this and that person was trying to make schemas for web assembly code or something like that which is pretty out there use case but uh, of course if we can find a way to make everything work then it would be great to lift this restriction but at, at least it's clear what works and what doesn't instead of uh, getting a stack overflow sometimes okay so uh, there are several possible algorithms that can be used to implement all these operations on sekexes like uh, regular expressions and regular grammars and finite state automata are equivalent theoretically and also practically in the sense that uh, finite state automatons can be used to uh, do regex processing and um, in the good old tools like grep and lex uh, use deterministic finite automata which are the smallest and fastest and most efficient variety and then there are the non-deterministic finite automata that are not as uh, efficient but and they can be also or often they are used as an intermediate step to construct the deterministic automaton and a completely different approach is using a backtracking parser and those can actually parse context free languages and even um, context sensitive ones so it's sort of overpowered and it's not as efficient and there are some uh the worst case efficiency is pretty bad if you're not careful like uh, Perl and uh, uh, Java and all those regex engines actually use this because they have some crazy back reference operators and stuff like that and there's even an attack that's uh, called regex denial of service where you if you can input a regex to some server then you can give them a regex that will trigger the worst case behavior and it will take forever to process your thing that's like a little string and uh, then there's the less known uh, regex derivative approach which can also be used to generate the deterministic finite automaton uh, like the racket version of lex uh, does it that way and uh, spec uses derivatives dynamically like it uh, constructs the derivative on the fly and passes using that uh, but uh, that's not very efficient either And uh, okay, here I have some tables about the efficiency. So uh, basically there are two general approaches to this uh, SecX matching and uh, parsing. But there's a breadth first search and then there's depth first search. Now, uh, the backtracking and the memoist backtracking those use depth first search and all the other ones are 
breadth first search. And uh, typically, a breadth first search has very nice time usage. It's linear, which is the best you can do, even theoretically. But the space usage is a pretty terrible, usually. And the, the depth first search is the reverse. Well, the worst case time can be really bad, but the space usage is linear. And um, yeah, the deterministic finite automaton is awesome because it takes linear time and a constant space. Like you only need to store the automaton itself. But it's not applicable here because um, the alphabet of every closure datum or actually like Java object is infinite. Uh, and uh, even UTF would be pretty bad. So way back in the day, uh, DFA was awesome because uh, we were using ASCII. But uh, it's, it just doesn't work here. And the NFA one is a pretty straightforward breadth first search. It's just that uh, the non-determinism is it's sort of in multiple states of the automaton at once. So you have to sort of simulate that. And uh, the space usage is proportional to the size of the reg x so, because it can be in any place inside the reg x and um, yeah but the nice thing about this is that you can deduplicate the thread so it's it can't be in one state in several ways at once. So you don't get the general breadth first search exponential space usage. Um, and that's what we started with, like uh, just using the SecX code. And that was actually Tommy's idea, but I thought that was good. So I tried to do it that way. But actually, when we also have to implement parse, encode, and decode, the, the space deduplication doesn't work for those. So you get into the exponential space usage. So I had to pivot on that. So I used quite a lot of time to optimize the SecX code, and then I had to just throw it away. <laughs> or maybe it would, could be merged back into SecX, but that library doesn't get any attention these days. So, um, so I had to uh, go either to the backtracking or the dynamic derivatives. And uh, with the backtracking, as we will see, you can use caching or the memoization to make the time usage linear and increasing the space usage. Uh, somewhat like multiplied by the size of the regex, which is fine. But with uh, the dynamic derivatives, I don't know of a similar approach. It's probably possible because there's that uh, parsing with derivatives stuff from uh, the racket guy, guys. And I think they got pretty good results, but it's not as well established as the memoization approach. So I'll go into more depth on this, how this, Backtracking approach works. 
So it's basically a parser combinator library inside Molly. It's not exposed, but it's so we used to create the parsers for SecX schemas and also the validators, explainers, encoders, decoders. Uh, those work similarly to the parsers code that I'm showing here. And uh, unparse doesn't need to do any of this fancy parsing stuff. It's really straightforward. So anyway, to parse uh, an item, which is like that int or string or whatever, a base schema or a map schema, whatever you want, you know, it, this item parser gets past the parser function for that item and then it returns the parser which takes the input collection and then it checks uh, whether that's empty in which case it's invalid if it's not empty then we take the first item and we use the parsing function and uh, if the result of that is valid then we return that result and the rest of the collection and uh, it's just like very typical parser combinator approach and it, yeah if it was invalid then just return invalid well that's how this compose in the error case um and the end parser is for when the collection should be empty because often in parsing, you can sort of just parse the prefix, but when we are validating inputs, we want the whole input to be valid and not just like a prefix of it. So uh, this gets used internally to ensure that. And uh, it, well, it just does the whether the collection is empty and it, if it seems, then it just returns nil as the parsed value and then the collection itself. And then we have the units and functor parsers as uh, with parser combinators, you pretty much always get that. And functor is a fancy word and unit is almost as fancy, but it doesn't really matter. This category theory stuff like this pure parser for the unit parser just takes some constant value and when it gets any input collection it just returns that value that it has closed over and the input and uh, the map parser just takes some function and uh, another parsing function and then it uses the parsing function on the input collection and if the result was valid, then it uh, calls the function on the result and then it returns that and the uh, rest of the collection, which is down this structure here. And uh, these are used to implement some of the other parsers internally. And then we have the concatenation parser, which like, actually implants the uh, concatenation operation. Um, uh, there's a bit of reduced boilerplate because this is variadic. You can have any number of these, but basically just uh, parse with the first parser. Yeah. And if that was, was okay, then uh, Pass with the second parser and you know keep going and uh, then we like add the new uh, let's see and then like the results are accumulated into this VS and um, Alt implements the alt schema parsing. 
Um, and here the idea is like parse with the first one. And if that was valid, uh, then just you know, return the result. And if not, then uh, pass with the next one and hope that that is valid. And if they are all invalid, just you just get the last invalid result. And uh, then we have the clean star parsing, parsing which is uh, like the tricky part. Actually, like we have this loop here because we want zero or more things passed with this one parser. And this parser can match uh, zero or more items itself. And uh, the way it works is we just, uh, we, again, we have this accumulator of these and we pass with our parser and if it was uh, uh, valid, then we add the result to the accumulator and uh, recur. Otherwise, we just return the accumulated one. So if we get an error, we just say, OK, then there were no more of uh, these ones, but it's fine. And uh, the most complicated one is the repeat parser. And I said that this isn't even primitive, but uh, uh, we could implement it by concatenating uh, mean copies of this and then uh, max minus mean copies of an optionalized version of this. But you know, you would get a potentially a pretty big closure and uh, SecX actually does that because uh, in the breadth first search uh, methodology there's no choice but it's a nice bonus of the back checking approach that we can just write these uh, rather annoying loops to implement this repeat repeat it's uh, very similar to the clean star one, but it's more complicated because you have to keep track of the count. And then the optional and uh, the clean plus can actually be derived from those other more primitive ones. And uh, unlike the repeat parser, there's no reason not to do it like this. Like, uh, hopefully, the JIT will inline everything away and it will be the same as if these were written manually, but there's less code. Like, uh, an optional is either the thing or uh, a pure parser of nil, which means like. Okay, it was not that one, then give me anything and I'll give you nil. And the clean plus one is just pause one and then zero or more. And then, you know, <laughs> add the first one to the front. Uh, fairly typical parser combinator stuff. Uh, but uh, this uh, direct style approach has a problem, which is if we have a schema like this, where uh, there are zero or more, um, well, here are positive integers. And then after that, you have a four. <laughs> and uh, what this does is you, uh, it's the same as like making these calls to the internal functions. But uh, it gives invalid, but it should actually give like, okay, there's that two, which is like, we had one positive integer. And then there's the four, which is like just the four. 
Um, but the problem is that, uh, well, the, the operator should be greedy so that on well, this pause matches both of these. But uh, if it does that, then this uh, doesn't get to match anything. So we should uh, back check actually at that point. But we can't backtrack into like, inside the loop because you know we have already exited the loop. Or uh, oh well, anyway, the loop needs to be instrumented somehow so that we can backtrack into a previous iteration. And the solution is to capture the continuation inside that loop, which is a fairly heavyweight thing, but that's what I had to do to make this work. So if we, we start, need to CPS convert all the parsers, and um, like the item parser, now we get the collection as we did earlier, but we also get a stack of backtracking points, which isn't used for anything here. And then we get a continuation, which is uh, just a function that we call to return a result. So it works like previously, but uh, if uh, this one succeeds, then we call the continuation with the result and the rest of the collection instead of uh, returning a vector of those. And then the end parser just uh, checks that uh, the collection is empty and if it is, it uh, calls the continuation and gives it a nil and the collection. And um, if the collection is not empty, then you know this returns nil, but what's more important is it doesn't call the continuation. So that's how it fails now. Uh, in scheme, we, we could just use call with current continuation and everything would be awesome. As long as that is uh, implemented efficiently. And uh, the unit and function process are also just like, we need to add the stack of backtracking points and the continuation, and then we return by uh, calling the continuation here. A very mechanical, like some compilers do this CPS conversion automatically as part of compilation. So it really is quite mechanical, although usually, you know, they don't have this uh, stack of backtracking points to deal with. And this uh, clean star one is why we started this whole CPS conversion th thing. So what happens here is we just sort of remember the fallback, which is, uh, okay, stop the loop now. And uh, that is just pushed onto the stack, which is mutable. And uh, then we call the parser, uh, the inner parser. And when that returns uh, the value and the remainder of the se input sequence, uh, then we park this and this is not as a backtracking point, but for uh, tail call optimization, because we also need to do that manually because uh, closure doesn't do that either. And uh, scheme would um, But it's nice that we can sort of use the same stack for uh, this tail call optimization that we're using for the backtracking points. And uh, again, the repeat parser is similar to that one. 
but it's more complicated because we need to track the limits. And the alternative thing is pretty simple. Like we just take the fallback and push it onto the stack and then use the like that one that comes first in the alternatives. And the concatenation one is actually, like this is simpler than the concatenation parts that we had previously with because now we can just like pass with the first one and uh, then here in its continuation, if it returns something, then we just uh, pass with the other ones and uh, accumulate the results. And um, to make all this work, you know, something has to take the continuations of the stack and call them. And uh, that's done in this uh, parser, which is, you know, this bad naming is also typical for uh, parsing combinator libraries. Here it doesn't matter as much because this is just molly internals that you're never going to call anyway. But uh, here, like, need to add the end parser uh, to the already generated parsers so that uh, the whole input sequence gets matched and especially if it isn't even valid and um, then we just check, check the sequence shell in the first place and then we make that mutable stack and then some other mutable stuff. And you know, don't worry, like this is just internal, like externally, this function is pure. And um, then we just unstart the parsing. And if the overall parsing succeeds, then we set success to true and this result to whatever we get from there. And um, if it got there, then we just return the result. Um, if it uh, didn't, then um, we'll just keep doing that. But uh, we pop the parser of that stack. And this is the trampoline part. Like uh, parse with something that comes from the uh, backtracking point stack. And um, if it succeeds, then you know, return the result. If it doesn't, uh, then keep looping. And uh, if we run out of back checking points then just return invalid um yeah and the memoization like all this and uh, we still have an exponential behavior which is not a very happy case but we can use caching, which is called memoization for some reason here. And um, uh, this is similar to the GLL algorithm used in InstaPars and the Packrat parsing used in various PEG tools, if you ever use those. And the idea is that um, instead of having the stack be just a simple stack, then I made it an object which uh, keeps track of, if you get into the same point in the secx and the same point in the sequence, uh, then you, that we have been too earlier, then we already know what to do. This, it's in the memoization table. But uh, 
this is simplified from uh, those other ones, but we don't even need to put anything in the memoization table. It's just a uh, mutable hash set because uh, recursion is forbidden. So if we get to the same point, then uh, we know that uh, that will fail because uh, that's the only way we can sort of get back to where we were. And uh, the memoization table has to be like per parse instead of global for the entire lifetime of the program. So it needs to be injected into the parsers, but there's some synergy because the backtracking stack was injected already. So um, it's not too bad. Like I get the injection for free. And I had to make the memoization table from scratch because um, Molly can specify, like, use the ES6 uh, set polyfill because Molly is just a dependency or maybe a transitive dependency. And the one who is making the actual program in Closure Script needs to specify which polyfills to use and so on. Maybe something could be done about this. But I don't know if people even want that, you know, dependencies could specify uh, compiler options. On the other hand, that's a bit fishing. Okay, so after all this, like, my implementation is uh, 10 times faster than spec, which is pretty nice, but um, if you don't have to use SecX, uh, don't use it because like the sequential schema is 20 times faster than the uh, simple SecX. We could add some sort of optimizer. I have, we have discussed it also for uh, non-SecX things, but uh, that Yeah, that would need to be optional. Because you need to have some transparency to what schema is actually being used to make sense of the errors and so on. And yeah, to clarify, the optimizer would just say, oh, oh you're using this and uh, this thing is not uh, even a SecX. You could, you could just use this and I'll just do it for you like a compiler optimization. Yeah, anyway, so overall assessment of this experience is I got to like put several theories into practice, which is actually a quite rare occurrence. Well, this was an open source project and not consulting for a client, but still. And sometimes you know you need to know a lot to be able to pivot successfully like well actually having a lot of theoretical knowledge also was needed to recognize that okay uh, there could be some corner case maybe it's like this and indeed there was and now you have to do something completely different And uh, well, the thing, like the perfect moment in programming is when you get to do this hunting high and low thing where you have high level concepts like CPS conversion and parsing theory. And you also have this low level efficiency like, <laughs> The hash set uses uh, some bit twiddling. I tried to use like um, a volatile with a persistent hash set, and it just it was way too slow. It 
never finished running the tests. Yeah, anyway, thank you. And uh, here's some links like the blog, which has a lot of the same content. And then there's this uh, another blog, blog, which I read about GLL parser combinators, and that also inspired InstaParse. And uh, this parsing technique is my a parsing tome. It's like over a thousand pages about parsing theory, or not even parsing theory, just uh, different ways to do parsing. I uh, wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but uh, I read it. So. And uh, yeah, you can find my stuff on GitHub.